thanks for that introduction. Uh, real quick, the obligatory, uh, the obligatory statement that I have to say here is that the views that I express are mine. I do not speak on behalf of uh, the U.S. Space Force, the U.S. Air Force, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Air Force, or the U.S. government. So, and this is me. Uh, like I was introduced, uh, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Salaya from the U.S. Space Force. Um, I was also a part of the Attention and, Co and a Cognitive Control lab, uh, Laboratory at the Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford, which is where a, a lot of this research comes from. Uh, so what I want to do is I just want to talk a little bit about, about math and, and how that applies to the world. And specifically, I want to do that through what I call requirements. Now, requirements in a military uh, con context means acquisitions. It means going out and, and, and grabbing a, a, a contract. Okay, so it's how we take vendors and match them up with, uh, with the uh, um, uh, requesters. One of the issues that I see, though, is the process of actually making that request, because a lot of the, re of the requesters maybe have an inappropriate model of how to request AI or automation. So I might see something like this. I need AI to run my logistics, which is a pretty broad and vague thing to ask for. I want AI to do new candidate interviews for personnel hires. Again, extremely broad. Okay, and then we can go through a, through a few of these to, to sort my, my data, to speed up processing timelines, and on, and on, and on. And we have these, these types of requests, and I see these continually. But I just want to focus real quick on this one in, in particular. I want AI to do new candidate interviews for personnel hires. So you might ask a few questions. So what solution are, so our job might be to help step them through to find the correct uh, solution. So it might be, what solution are you trying to find? Well, they might not know exactly. There's so much out there, they actually don't know where to start. Okay, so then tell me, what problem are you trying to solve? Then, gen then generally you'll get a very large and high, high, high level problem. Like, I, wa I want to uh, remove bias from uh, the uh, selection process. Okay, then how exactly do you want AI to help with that? I, th I, th I think we just need to take the, the uh, human out of uh, the loop. Okay, well, okay, so then who should do it? Uh, let's uh, contract you to uh, do that, please, right? And so these are very broad gen and uh, generic things. Then we try to then make a solution fit with a very nebulous problem. So what I want to do then is I want to bridge the communication gap between the developers and the, the requesters and then to encourage metacognitive and human machine teaming considerations that we're going to talk about in the next couple of minutes. But first, I want to use an example to, to, uh, to tease out what I'm trying to get at. I, I enjoy um, lifting weights. So we're going to talk about the world-equipped deadlift record. This is Gary Frank in the 2002 when he pulled 422.5 kilograms off the floor, setting one of the first and the earliest uh, records in this particular e event. And so if you were to take all of the records since then and to tease them out into, into a line, you, you then have the ability to make a mathematical model. So we take outputs and we then draw a mathematical model. Great. So these, these uh, models, they often have a, a, um, a little bit of error, but they're always based on some type of an equation, which gives us a little bit of uh, the ability to predict future e events. One of the other, th other things that you'll often hear or that you might often pro produce is a model for the particular inputs. So as we talk about a deadlift, let's just real quick ta uh, talk about that. To get a good deadlift max, you, you need, uh, sorry, you could either do it raw or equipped. Raw means it's just you and uh, the bar. Equipped means you have a belt, a, a deadlifting suit, wrist straps, chalk, okay? But raw is just you and the bar. So what you need for that, you need good lower body strength. You know, uh, l uh, leg drive, glutes, hamstrings, upper body strength, and uh, generically your back, your arms. As you transition into the equipped, you're gonna need something to keep you safe. Something that bridges the gap between raw and equipped. This is your belt, this is your, this is your, dead, your deadlifting suit. And then things that enhance your, your performance in the raw category, which would be wrist straps or chalk. You also have certain things that cross cut all, all of these dimensions, such as body mass. Body mass, there's a very high correlation between the more body mass that you have, generally the more you can pull off of the floor. Same, same thing with the technique, same thing with your mindset. So then going back to this chart now, let's, let's pretend that you're a vendor and you want to produce this, um, a, um, a mathematical model to predict the future of the world-equipped deadlift record. So then, I want you then to look at this chart and don't say it if you know the answer. 
when do, when do you think that the next record is going to be set? Okay, is it 2017, 2018? Based on the line, based on the, on the frequency? Okay, and then what weight do you think that that's going to be set at? Let's say you, set, let's say that you imagine it's going to be in 2017 or 18 at, four, uh, at, four, at 475. How much of your own money would you be willing to bet right now on that guess, based on this mathematical model, right? <laughs> be a bad bet. And so, what if I gave you an over-under of uh, 1.5 years and um, a 15K, uh, and um, a 15 um, a kilograms, okay? How much of your own money would you put? 100 pounds? Uh, 1,000 pounds? Would you put your life on it? That's what we ask some of our military members to, to do, is to put their lives on some of these types of products. And when it's prediction-based, and when the uh, probability of being correct is there's some variance there, that's a big ask. And so, just to put this out there, if we're just using outputs to derive more outputs, you would in fact be wrong because it was set the very same year at 500. There is no way that our current mathematical model could have predicted that. And just to complete the, the story, uh, Half Thor, uh, the mountain set 501 in 2020. Um, so let's go back to the model and see what happened. So we were just using outputs to derive more outputs. That was obviously not very helpful. One thing then to think about is that the inputs to that process, outputs are the, are the final part of a process. To use outputs to derive more outputs outside of that process would, generally does, does not work. It'll give you a starting point, but you have to think about the inputs first. And that's what I'm going to get at here is the data sets that we use, the inputs that we have into that process. This whole story, so it was Eddie the Beast Hall from England who pulled the 500 um, and in uh, 2016. He never pulled more than 463 in practice. He, he couldn't, there, there, was a, there was a mental block. That, that's a huge jump between 463 and, five, and a 500. They had, they had a hypothesis though, that if they were to use something else to get him to 500. And the question that they started with was, how does a mother pull a car off of a child? Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's something called adrenaline. And long story short, they had this hypothesis that could get him up to 90% of his, of his body's ability to pull, or just to do a 10% a jump or from wherever he was. So 90% so so of his body's ability, if you do the math, takes him up to 514 um, 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 kilograms. And then all, all of a sudden, 500 is no longer out of the question. And it is within the realm of the possible. And a new mathematical model based on individual inputs is now feasible and drives up trust in that, in that particular model. So as you have these people that need solutions, they look at the world of automation possibilities. Let's just imagine that this gray box represents the world of automation possibilities. This dot is one, is one solution that they could use. Let's just say that for the purpose of uh, this example that it's an, an alarm clock. An alarm clock is a rules-based way of telling time. You have uh, driverless cars. Okay, that's using some rules-based, but a lot of a, of a, of a prediction too. You have information processing, windmill. We could say the same thing for all, all of these types of technologies. But when these requesters look at the world of automation, it's huge. And they, they, they don't even know where to start. What, what do I even start asking for? So what happens oftentimes is we have vendors who contact people who might need a solution. And then they try to make a, a round hole and a square peg mix up. So they try to make the solution and the problem meet halfway instead of custom tailoring the solution for their individual problem. So to help bridge that communication gap, there's a great paper published in, uh, in the year 2000 by Paris, Suerman, Sheridan, and Wickens, or two, 2015. Um, and they looked at the world of automation possibilities. And they started to see some um, differences. And as they then were able to then narrow those down, they were able to take the world of automation and they were able to containerize. And then all, all, all of a sudden, the world of, of automation became much more palatable for anyone to use and to, and to access. They were able to tease out some of the similarities in each of these, con, of these uh, containers. There was information acquisition, information analysis, decision and action selection, and the action execution. Interestingly enough, these functional classes of automation line up very, very nicely with human information processing and John Boyd's OODA loop, which we you know, use a lot. Um, so to use an example here now, 
I often hear that people want to, in, to automate one part of, the, the, of uh, the OODA loop. Let's automate the observe part. So that would be the information, acquisitional, the information acquisition functional class. So what people think happens is that then humans no longer have to do this piece. And they believe that this is now the, the new timeline. And as a uh, metacognitive scientist, I'm here to say that that is not the case. What happens is they still have to observe and process the output of your algorithmic solution. And you might say, oh, well, yeah, of course. I mean, that's no duh, right? But so here's where trust comes into play. So let me put this into a timeline using the human information processing. If this is a notional timeline for an action for a human-centric process, and you want to automate the sensory processing piece or the information processing piece, so you will have time savings in a nominal in an environment where everything's going well. But what happens when things don't go well? What, ha what happens when the variance around the probability of being correct is too great where there's a loss of trust after the input? In the, in the, in the, in the academic uh, um, um, uh, literature, this is called algorithm aversion. It's where the effects of loss of trust are impacted on the front end of that, of that decision timeline. And the decision timeline is worse than if you hadn't used that solution in the first place. Then conversely, algorithmic overtrust is where the uh, effects are felt on the back end. One other way to make this very, pal very palatable for the, for the requesters, or even for the, for the, for the, for the vendors, is Paris Uerman, Sheridan, and, uh, and Wickens came, came up with levels of automation. We, we, we've heard people talk about aug augmented information, or human in the loop, or hum human out of the loop, on the loop, whichever ter terminology that we use. The levels of automation give a very uh, pal palatable step-by-step -step and incremental approach to whichever level that you want to get to. Because oftentimes, right now, what happens is I want humans to do or sorry, I want, I want an AI to do my new candidate uh, interviews. I, I want to go from one, where the human's doing everything, to 10, where the AI does everything. And they're skipping all of these steps. There is a lot of goodness that can be found from even just going to step two, where your automated counterpart offers a complete set of uh, decision um, and action alternatives. Because there, there's a lot of human decision making that has to go into that code to really make that happen. Uh, there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of piping that, that has to be built. There's, there's a lot of infrastructure. And so as you incrementally invest in these smaller steps, you will then weed out the things that you're trying to weed out, and bias might be one of those things that you can tease out from, these, from the, spending time at these lower steps. Which brings me to the automation spectrum. So what a lot of companies that I've spoken with or in the, or in the DOD, what a lot of people miss is, is a strategy on how to actually make this happen. How to take a process from the manual spec, what I call the manual spectrum, over towards the, um, towards the infinity side as the automation increases. So let me just show what this strategy could look like. So this is the automation, or what I call the automation spectrum. To the left of zero is the manual spectrum, human-centric. So here are the human inf information pro processing steps. Then if you, if you can see, this looks a lot like our deadlifting example where you have something that's simple here and something that's more complex here and then things that cross cut all of those, all, all of those containers. So in the blue, this is the rules based, this is fixed. So, there, so the probability of being correct is much, much higher if not, if not one. And then here is the prediction based. And, and you'll see that AI is not on this chart. The name AI is not on this chart. However, it is contained within the autonomous applications. And it's a subset of the autonomy spectrum. So to me, as, as we work to uh, define this and to uh, publish this uh, a, um, a couple of uh, years ago, underneath the automation spectrum is all automation. So all AI is automation, but not all automation is AI. And that's an important uh, distinction. I, I know there are a lot of different ways of, of uh, defining this. But if you define it simply as a prediction-based cap cap uh, capability, and then you can break it down into narrow and to, and to uh, um, generalized, that gives you various uh, probabilities with various variances that can then drive the human-machine teaming and the metacognitive components that are very, very important, such as trust, re uh, reliance, and uh, confidence. Okay, So you go from simple process automation. I want to take this human process. I just want to automate one, one thing. I just want to go from one to two. 
Okay? And then you can have a complex pro uh, process where you have multiples of these feeding into your machine learning or whatever type of algorithmic learning solution that you have, which then goes into the autonomous application and then to an autonomous um, system and then a um, system of um, systems. And so as you then incrementally go towards this, this side, that is how you can incrementally invest. And then, oh, by the way, the functional classes exist within each of these, hence why they cross cut. So you can develop within that individual process, within the level of automation, within the functional class, within the cylinder. And then, as, then from a strategic standpoint, you can develop the uh, backbone that you're going to need to actually have human trust in some of these, uh, in so, in, uh, some of these uh, um, uh, solutions. This is an example of, of a question flow you could use when uh, dealing with a customer. So you walk them through, you know, what should be automated? So hopefully this will help. And then this is, the, this is the key piece here. Help them step through the types of automation. And oh, by the, by the way, each of these can be prediction-based or they can be rules-based. And the, and the answer doesn't always have to be prediction-based. Sometimes rules-based is best, then followed by the AI piece. And then you can go through all of these various criteria, which are to then I I identify the levels of automation, then you have your evaluative cri criteria, then you, re then you refine, you evaluate again, and then uh, you finalize. But let's talk about one last piece here, trust. So trust is often misused um, in most venues that I go to, um, which is a huge part of the metacognitive experience. Trust is not how good that something is, even though that's generally what we think of. If it's better, then people will, uh, will um, trust it. So that's not always true. Um, even though a plane is not uh, AI, how many people have a panic attack when they uh, get onto a plane, right? Even though planes are very good. So they don't trust it, they'll, but they'll still rely on it. That, that's a big difference. Um, so this is from a paper from uh, the early 2000s where in the organizational management literature, and, and our hypothesis is that human-machine teaming relationships will follow human-human re uh, relationship models. So we have a trustee, which is the AI counterpart, which is what we changed to the AI counterpart, and the human truster. The initial trust is built up of three things. The ability, which is still the highest weighted piece, then the benevolence, and then the integrity of that trustee. But also, the human has a propensity to, to trust, because not everyone trusts in the same way, because we are all different. This is where the diversity piece comes into uh, play very, very strongly. Because this propensity to trust will then color the way that the, a, that the ABI goes into the overall relationship trust. In more recent years, Hoff and Bashir expanded this even further. And they took this human's propensity to trust, and they, they exploded that out. And there are, uh, there are so many things that go into this piece right here. This is a decade's worth of research here that needs to happen. But the trustee characteristics, so that dispositional trust, the things you bring to the table, culture, gender, all of these things that you bring to the table, how does that impact your ability or desire or any of these things to use that particular solution or types of, of uh, solutions? Then there's also your, your um, situational and your initial learned trust factors. The system performance and characteristics are factors, but they aren't the whole thing. And so this all goes into a dynamic trust model that changes with each iteration that the human user has, is with, that has with your, uh, with your uh, product. Because this is the ultimate goal. This is, the key take, this is one of the key ta takeaways, is for me, what I want is proper reliance. I want people to use it appropriately. I don't want them to over-trust where the perceived reliability is higher than the actual, because then we have that, that failure on the back end. Where, or if, they, if, they, if the actual reliability is higher than the perceived, then they're going to use it less than, than they should. And then the effects will be felt on the front end of that uh, decision-making timeline, which causes consternation and questions between the vendor and the, the uh, requ um, um, a requester. Whereas if they exercise the one-to-one -one proper reliance, then they will be able to appropriately use that piece of equipment, that, that uh, solution. And so again, trust is not, is not reliance, it's not, it's not the same thing. And hopefully, the more that we can use those, the same terms, we can set ourselves up for uh, future uh, multidisciplinary uh, research on the, this topic. Um, and as I said, all AI is automation, but not all automation is AI. And incremental advancement today en enables comprehensive success tomorrow. And so that's it. Thank you for uh, your time.
Aaron, I noticed that you failed to tell us what your own personal best was at deadlifting. Oh, I did like 20 years ago. I, <laughs> I, 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 don't, re I don't remember. Yeah. It's, it's been that long. I, I, I don't lift heavy any, anymore because I'm too old. I just go for function and for health. So, but uh, I, do, I do love it though. Fair enough. Absolutely. Um, when your um, presentation started and you, you, you went down the route of automate my hiring for me, I was starting to get the impression that this was gonna, this was gonna be a talk disparaging AI, saying, mm. saying you know, may, maybe we're overusing it. And in the end, that, that wasn't where you were going with it. But do you think that there is a sense of, oh, AI can fix it? And, and people just, just assume it's a silver bullet, solve the problem. Absolutely, 100%. I've, I've seen it time and time and time again where I go in to consult on something and oftentimes, and unfortunately, the solution that is being introduced, and not by the vendor, but by the, by, by the middle uh, individuals that are going to the higher ups within the company, um, often the solution that's pitched is, has more potential for bias than the original uh, problem because of things that we aren't think, um, thinking about, such as the un, uncanny valley, such as English as a second language when you're trying to use language processing, such as the face that you use on uh, the interview. Yeah. Um, all of these things can have potential bi uh, um, uh, biases. So then the question that I always ask is, is it worth it for, for all of these? Because then in the end, are you actually marginalizing the population you're trying to target more, which might actually be the uh, case. Aaron, that was truly fascinating. Thank you very much for your time and for coming to speak to us. Thanks. All right. Thank you.